um, we are going to uh, do a little bit of a different format for this, this series and that um, normally what we do is we read the scripture just like, just like we did and then I talk for a bit and then we just respond with some more music, which is fine, nothing against that. It's a formula that works for most people. Um, but what we're going to do through this series is because I want to fly a little bit closer to the text. I, I, I want to stay in the Word as much as possible and, and kind of just process with you uh, my own study, which um, is not the same as a sermon in, the, <laughs> in, in that sense. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to read the passage. We're going to walk through the passage. I'll be using the ESV to kind of uh, translation to walk through the passage. And then we'll reread it again and maybe in like an NIV or something kind of in the middle. And because um, that's that's how I study. I usually use three translations when I study, um, and they're all free on your phone. So you know, no one. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, we we have such access to these things. It's 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 just, it's astound it's astounding to me. But we're going to read through this, and we're going to think about it in terms of paragraphs. Um, this is something that. I heard early on it was very helpful for me. One of the ways, just one of the small ways we can, we can avoid taking individual verses out of context um, is to read those verses not just as a verse, but as a paragraph, as a complete thought. Um, it's even better if you read the entire chapter, and even better than that if you, we can read the whole book at once, uh, like we did last week. Everyone remember that, how, how wonderful that was? Um, it was good for my heart. I, I, in all sincerity, it really was. Um, but we're going to try to move in terms of paragraph chunks this morning, and that's what we'll tend to do. And what I do is, is kind of ask the question as I go through, what sticks out? What, what's, what's hitting me here? And, um, and how does what I know about this letter, all those things we talked about last week, the broader context and culture, how do the things I know about this letter inform my question here, or am I still left with a question I don't have an answer to, and then I have to take a step back and wonder if I'm asking the right question or if I, there's something else I, I need to learn. But one of, the, uh, one of the temptations in approaching Scripture this way, because um, I realize that I, I'm doing this right now because I see um, there's always a slippery slope in how you approach the Word of God. There's always a way that sin can find a way in through the side door. And, um, and I'm seeing some of those things on, my other, on the way I typically approach Scripture. Um, but I also know that I felt in my heart uh, another slippery slope this week. And uh, I was reading a book by Eugene Peterson, who was the guy who translated the message. He wrote a book called Subversive Spirituality, which Bill Brunton actually gave me a copy of. And in the very first chapter, he's walking through, or he's about to walk through, uh, the Gospel of Mark. And something he says about the Word of God um, hit my heart. He, says, he said that, um, there's a temptation when you come to do a study of a, of, of a book of the Bible that, that, that we don't come to, the, to Scripture to master it. We come to the Word of God to be mastered by it. And I just, I realized that that was a temptation. It's a temptation to say, let's figure out what this says so that way we know it and then we can move on to the next book. And then we can know that and then we can and have a sense of I've mastered the Word of God. Oh, goodness gracious. I felt that pride in my heart. I did. Um, and I don't want that. I want us to come together not to feel like we're going to get everything figured out, but so we can come under the Word of God and just submit to it, be humbled by it, uh, let it speak over our lives and inform who we are to be, not so we can understand it and know it and add more information to our tool belt, but um, so we can live a life of humility and mercy and justice um, that's mastered by the Word of God. So that was... Uh, my humbling uh, kick in the pants from God this week, um, one of them. So we're going to look at Paul's opening section of this letter today. Um, it's a nice little section, and it's unique in many ways for a letter for this time, and we'll talk about that. But Paul's basically spending several verses. He's thanking God for some things. He's, he's appreciative of some things, and he's also asking God for some things. So we need to look at that. We need to walk through this. Um, as I said, the, the, the letter is a bit different. It opens up normally, like other first century letters that we have copies of and so forth, but then it goes somewhere different, somewhere very different. Actually, right off from verse 2, it's already something different. Um, and we'll look at that. We'll look at that today because he expands. Um, he does something that's unique. He goes on from just, hey, this is who I'm writing to, to saying, this is what I think about when I think about you. It's very intimate. 
um, very personal. And then he sums it all up in verse 11 with that reality that if these things were operating in our lives, he would, he would invite the world and invite more praise and glory to God. It's powerful. And this section is a stitched together with thanksgiving and praise. And um, um, it's just a wonderful picture of where Paul's heart is for these people and seemingly where Timothy's heart is for these people. But let's, let's take a look. Um, the first section is verses 1 and 2. Um, we'll be stopping a lot, just FYI. Paul and Timothy. Okay, let's stop there. Um, Bill mentioned this. He includes Timothy. That's really unique because every scholar that I can find, every uh, commentary I can find, there is no question that Paul's the one actually writing the letter. It's Paul's letter, Paul's letter to the Philippians. But he includes Timothy. A couple reasons for that, maybe. We know Timothy is going to be coming to them pretty quickly, uh, almost maybe directly after this letter arrives. Um, but it's more than that. It's, it's these things that Paul's writing down. These, this is from the heart of him and Timothy together. Um, and Paul is sending someone to deliver the letter. He's sending it. We, we talked, we mentioned him last week when we read, well, of course we mentioned it. We read the entire letter. Um, but his name is, is Epaphroditus. And he's giving him the letter to go to the church at Philippi to read that letter out loud and field any questions and explain things. That's what the carriers of those letters would do. Um, so maybe he's including Timothy here because when Timothy gets there, he'll be able to help explain some things too. I, I don't know, but either way, we know that what Paul's putting down here is something him and Timothy have both shared. These are, these are sentiments and thoughts and prayers and longings and hopes that they both seem to have for these people. Paul's just the one who has the chance to, to dictate the letter. And then servants of Christ or slaves of Christ. All right, stop there. Um, we, we won't stop this much. But let me just say why this is a big deal. Paul is identifying himself and Timothy as slaves. We know that, as we said last week, up to 50% of the population in Philippi was a slave class. And if, if you were a slave, you either, one, didn't want anybody to know about it, or if they knew about it, you wanted to make sure they knew that you were going to be working your way out of it. This is not the condition, this is not the status I'm going to keep for the rest of my life. Paul is proudly identifying him and Timothy as slaves of Jesus, as servants of Jesus, um, because it seems that the gospel, the kingdom, the priorities have so shifted in his life that he is proud to be considered a slave for Jesus, and that is so countercultural for him. Um, and it really in, it shows us how his status of his life has been turned upside down. He will explain a little bit more about that later, but, but his status is turned upside down, and it's not a bother to him. It's a badge of honor, almost the sense of, I'd rather be a slave in the house of the true king than a king of my own world, you know? Um, he has found a path to glory as a slave, which would have just, at first reading in this church, would have been strange, really strange for them to hear. Um, let's keep reading. To all the saints... In, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi, with the overseers or the elders and, and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. One thing I didn't know, really, um, until recently, was that the phrase grace to you is a very common uh, first century letter introduction. A lot of people said it. You can find other letters that weren't Christian. Uh, people said grace to you is a very common way of greeting people. But Paul has now reclaimed this common greeting, and he adds to it. You see this idea that it's not just grace to you. It's, it, there, it, there's a source of this grace, right? Because Paul has, has now seen that grace is the movement of the gospel. This is God's movement into the world. It's coming from God. It's coming through Jesus Christ to all those people who believe. Um, and so he's, he's not, in some ways, he's, he's saying the way everyone has started their letter before, I know where that can actually come from. And it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, he's redeemed this little part of the culture. I just find it interesting. Let's move on. Verses 3 through 6. That's kind of the first break here. Uh, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always, in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy, because... Okay, so, so this is interesting. Paul is grateful for who they are. And it's, it's, a, it's a powerful thing because of your partnership in the gospel. And this is the first use of that word koinonia that we talked about last week. 
The word partnership here, which is unique the way he uses it. Your partnership in the gospel. The, we've talked about koinonia before here. We, we've talked about how it represents fellowship and intimate connection and relational connection in, in, in a way that's much deeper than just normal friendship. It really means family, a new family in many ways. But what he's putting it in the context of is, in some ways, he's using it almost like a business term. And in the first century, that was used a lot. People who had contracts together and partnerships together, they had a, 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 a unity over a common goal in business. And it was often connected with family, because if you were in business, you were often in business with your family. And what Paul seems to be saying here is that I'm thankful for you because now we're both in a new family business together, which is a unique thing. Um, and it's shown through the financial support that they've given him, of course, and the prayer they've given him. Um, they show the partnership. They show the love and the new family business. It says, from the first day, which is probably a rec- uh, calling back to Acts 16, whenever Paul first moved to Philippi and got thrown in jail that first time. Um, from the first day until now. And then looking at verse 6, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ, the day of the Messiah. This is what I would call, a, 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 and what I've heard before called a hyperlink. Um, it's an Old Testament hyperlink. Um, it's a word, it's a phrase that should bring to your mind things that have already been talked about in previous books of the Bible, Old Testament stories and so forth. This idea of the day of the Messiah. That's a, um, it's the first hyperlink that I've seen so far. But it's sort of a callback to the Old Testament concept of the day of the Lord. You know, it was in Psalms all the time. It was in the prophets all the time. This, this, this day when God would make everything right, when he would reckon with creation and people and he would judge and he would set everything the way it's supposed to be. Now, Paul has sort of taken that phrase and sort of put Jesus on it, showing that if you're going to think about how God's going to make the world right, if you're going to think about uh, the, 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 when, when God brings everything to completion and reckons with everything, you've got to see that through the person of Jesus. You've got to see God's work through Jesus in his redemption of everything. It's not just the day of the Lord. It's the day of Jesus Christ. Um, and in some ways, this idea of God putting everything right, now because he's bringing Jesus into it. Oh, I don't know if you guys love this as much as I do, but I really enjoy this stuff. Um, it seems like he's speaking in two directions, right? It's sort of, the, it's sort of a, a, an already not yet reality, right? He's saying that God will bring something to completion, but he's also saying that God's already started something. You see that? He who began, it's already started a work and you will bring it to completion. It begins with Jesus, uh, and you see even what we, what we see here is the life of these believers. Um, and this is going to be a big theme for Paul for this letter, and I, I, I hope this makes sense. But the life of the believer becomes a mirror of the life of Christ himself and the redemption of God's creation as a whole, right? He, the day of the Lord, it now points back. It points with Jesus' announcing of the kingdom. The kingdom is here. You see his death and resurrection. God is clearly telling everyone that he's going to be redeeming this world in a very different way than the people thought he was going to be going about it. But now it also points to the future. Paul mentions this in chapter 3 of Philippians. It's through the work of Christ, the person of Christ, that God will then put things the way they're supposed to be put things right. That will be done in the future. And that vision of beginning with Jesus in his death and his resurrection, and that arc that then is completed when he finally calls everything to account and judges the world and puts it all right, that arc, that vision, he's saying is going on in your life too. It's in the life of the believer that God began a good work. He used Jesus in the beginning. He began a good work. And that will, that will come to a completion on the day of Jesus when everything else is put right, too. Um, let's move on. Seven and eight. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I, told, because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment 
and the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. You know, last Sunday was Father's Day. You either got a card, gave a card, or at least saw a card at the store, right? I think it's probably a fair statement. Um, we give these greeting cards to people all the time, and they say stuff like this. I hold you in my heart. You mean so much to me. You know, whatever. It's almost commonplace. We're used to this kind of language. People did not talk this way about each other back then. He actually says, when he, when he talks about the affection he has for them, like the affection of Christ, it's a word that literally means like guts or liver. It's like I ache within my stomach for you, just to be with you, to be a part of you, to, to go give you a hug. I just want to be with you so much. Um, it's, it's very, he even mentions the, the, that, it, that it's okay for me to talk this way. I realize this is a bit different. It's a bit fluffy and it's a bit flowery, but you mean so much to me. You really do. And he can't, it's like a part of his stomach. Ugh. Verse 9. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. Love is the word agape. It's the sacrificial charity and giving and so forth. It, it, it should abound and it should overflow. And I think that he's talking about a, an agape, a love that he has seen in them already, in the ways that they have already provided for him and given him financial help and so forth. He's saying that I know that you guys are sacrificially giving and sacrificing of your time and your money. But I need, I need that to flow over more and more. And it seems like he is shifting from himself and the gift that he has received from them because he's not asking for anything more from them. He's shifting from himself and, in, and, and imploring them to love one another. You know, this is difficult even when... It's difficult when you have a group of people that are even fairly like-minded to just abound in sacrificial love for one another. It's, very, it's, it's hard, even when people are roughly in the same social status and class and they land basically the same place on social issues. This is, is almost impossible in Philippi. There's one church. If you get upset, where else are you going to go, right? There's one church. They meet in one, guy's, or one lady's house, and, 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 and he is telling them that they need to abound in their love for one another. And, and there's people from across the spectrum. We mentioned the slaves. There's a large collection of lower class, a small elite class. And he's saying you all need to be sacrificially abounding in love for one another. And I'm sure every one of them has a, a valid or what they think is a valid excuse why they shouldn't give to the other people. But he's saying that abounds over and over and over. And that needs to be, you need to be known as a people of love in that sense. But he goes on. With abounding in love. With knowledge and all discernment or wisdom. So it is a love that is connected with knowledge and discernment. This is sort of the first time he begins to hold up things that typically don't get held up together. We talked about his theme of unity and holiness that he goes into. Thinking well, loving with a Christ-mindedness. Um, he gets into how you develop this, and he talks about that later. And we'll, we'll cover that later in one of his, one, it's, a, it's a key theme he keeps bringing up. But I can tell you that this is, um, every one of us probably lands on one side or the other of this. I know I do. For those of you who don't know me very well, left to my own devices, I'm quite codependent. Uh, meaning that if I can make you happy, I can feel happy myself. Uh, and if I'm not making somebody happy, I have a hard time being happy. Um, which means that I am very quick to give and sacrificially love other people. But I'm not always quick to do it with knowledge and discernment. I just think, how can I make things better for them? Ugh. Other people, they are very slow to make things better for anyone and sit back and say, let me make sure that if I do anything, it better be the right thing. And what was uh, General Patton said? Uh, <laughs> uh, a, a bad plan implemented today is better than a good plan implemented tomorrow. Sometimes, sometimes you don't have the luxury of time to help people. 
and you just have to step up and help people. Other times, you rush in too quick. The point is that we need to know what will actually help and what wouldn't help, and not just love without, without wisdom, and not sit back and just sit in contemplation of things and never actually help anybody. Those two things have to go together, and he holds them together. And I'm sure every person in this room is going to land on one side or the other of that issue. And I'm sure everyone in the room that he's reading this to also is landing on one side or the other of that issue. He's saying you need both. And why do we need both? He says in verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent. So you may actually know. It's a word that actually means actually beneficial, right? You need to love and abound in that love alongside growing in knowledge in Christ-mindedness, thinking like Jesus, which he talks about later. So it seems like this group is very loving, maybe, but they need to work on the thinking because of how much he talks about it. But we do this so, we, and so that they can approve what is excellent and know what is right and wrong in this situation. It reminds me of Genesis, you know? Like, I was thinking about this this week. I was reading this and thinking that, okay, I need to love with wisdom and discernment and knowledge and all those things, and then I will know what the right and the wrong thing to do in, in, is in a situation. And I realized that that was, that's our initial problem. Like, that, is, that was our foundational problem, that we wanted to find a way on our own to know what the right and the wrong thing to do was, right? It was the tree of knowledge and good and bad, and good and evil. We wanted to take that process for ourselves. And what Paul is saying is in the kingdom of God, there is a path to knowing the right and the wrong thing to do in a various situation, but it's not on your own. It is through, and I think we can also probably, if we had Timothy here or Epaphroditus and we said, it, when Paul's talking about these things, about the work he's doing in you and the way he's growing you and the way he's going to make you abound, is he talking about the Holy Spirit here? Because he doesn't mention the Holy Spirit. I think Timothy would have said, well, of course he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Who do you think does this in you, right? But, but this, is, this is something that we have to trust God for and lean into him for, and we have to process through how God is telling us and how Paul's t God's telling us through Paul in this letter how to think and discern and be wise. And he gets into that because otherwise, here's what happens. Not only will we not be able to prove what is excellent, but so that we will be pure and blameless, blameless on the day of Christ. The pure is a word for sincere, for sincere. And I can tell you, I can tell you as someone who is typically codependent and, and is willing to uh, love and give before I've thought about what is best for people, that love is not sincere. I'm not doing it because I think it will help them. I'm doing it because I think helping them will help me. Hmm. And that's not sincere. That's not pure love. It's, if we love without wisdom, without thinking, without looking at the world around us and saying, what will really help people? What is really best for people? And taking the effort and the discipline of, of, of moving into Christ-like thinking, the way Paul talks about, developing the wisdom with God through the power of the Holy Spirit, um, we will know what is right. And those motivations to love other people will be more sincere and pure. But I know in my life when I don't do that, um, it's not pure. It's not sincere. And then what happens is, when I go before God, not just on the last day, but even in prayer, I'm hit with the conviction. I'm not standing before him blameless. And there's some things to repent for. And here it is again, the day of the Messiah. Paul brings it up a second time. And I think what is, this is what's helpful for me when I see that, is I recognize that all this command to love and abound in love and to pursue wisdom and knowledge uh, and Christ-like thinking, it's not just so I can be some more moral person. It's not just to achieve a moral standard that I'm supposed to achieve. This is going somewhere. What this is saying is the way I live and love right now matters. It matters long term. It matters there's a day in which it will really matter. And I will have to stand before God. So I want to stand before God now and pray for the Spirit's help to abound in love alongside knowledge and wisdom and discernment. And when we do this, here's the beautiful thing. 
what happens is we are filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus. Here's, here's the thing that Paul is starting to do, which I mentioned that he was going to do in that introduction last week, and it's hard to see sometimes because these are verses I just read right through because they are, they are words that I've heard in church so much that I forget that these weren't common words when they were first written down. They meant something to people. They, they sent people somewhere. This fruit of righteousness, or the way it's translated some places, the fruit of right living, I would say this is very similar uh, to the fruit of the Spirit that he talks about in Galatians uh, 5. This, I think, is another hyperlink. I think this is another pointer back to Genesis. It's a pointer back to what it means to be a human being. So much of this world, and even their culture too, was trying to tell them what it meant to be human. And Paul is beginning to appeal to what it really means to be human. And what it means to be human is to be fruitful and to multiply. That's our original command. Not ultimately fulfilled in children, of course. Paul is saying, ultimately, we are called as human beings to be spreader of God's image through this world, to be fruitful and multiply. And in the kingdom of God, we see that. We see in Christ the ability to fulfill our original command. And Paul sees in the gospel, I believe, a reclaiming of what it means to be human, namely, to be God's children, to fruitfully reflect his image to this world, to fulfill that call. And it seems to me that Paul is talking about what it means to live a life through Christ. He's talking about right living, right heart postures, attitudes, behaviors, fruits of the Spirit that come out of us through this covenant relationship with God that is now ours through Jesus. And this idea of righteousness, he picks up later and uses it in a little bit different nuances because sometimes righteousness means the way you live. Sometimes it means God's faithfulness to us and the ways we are counted righteous because he was faithful and all those things. But, and Paul uses it with different nuances as he goes on. But he's laying out the ways that we can be fruitful. It comes through Jesus Christ, this new relationship we have with him. We can finally be who we were created to be. And then in verse 11, which wraps all of this up at the end of it, all of this is to the glory and praise of God, meaning that what God is going to do with this kind of community of people is he's going to use it to spread his glory and his praise. And I think that it's wise for us to keep a model of community like this before us. Um, I mentioned last week, I've been in church leadership probably too long. <laughs> I was really young. And, um, and it's really hard to, when you think about Paul's picture of a community here that continually brings glory to God and invites others to bring glory to God and spreads and multiplies and is fruitful, um, it's hard to lose track, or it's easy to lose track of that. And I think we need to keep pictures and models of this kind of community before us. Paul, in this letter, um, he's not just sitting there telling them what they shouldn't be, which is often what we ended up doing. Um, he is staying in the vision of what they should be and continually inviting them to it. Let's read it one more time. Stand with me, if you will, as we read the word. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, 
For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is God's Word. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this, um, for this little introduction to this letter that gives us a snapshot of what a community should be. We thank you for the ways it, it, it points us back and points us forward at the same time, helping us see that we exist with you in the middle of this grand story, that our life in some ways is meant to mirror that story as we began in the kingdom and then are completed in the kingdom. Uh, we ask that you keep our vision of that clear uh, so that we see ourselves on track uh, to be with you, to stand with you, pure and blameless on the day of the Messiah. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.